when you're bringing people into a second in command role, you have to hire people that have done it before. If you hire someone because they know how to do it, there's lots of people out there that have read books. You need to hire people that have done it before. If you want to have somebody who has, like, would you ever hire someone to build a house for you because they know how to do one? Or would you hire someone who's done it before? You probably want the one who's done it before, right? I was on a stage back around 2010 for Vern Harnish, the founder of the Entrepreneurs Organization. I walked off the stage and this guy came up to me and said, holy shit, you're Cameron. I went, yeah. He said, everyone's been walking around this conference for the last three days saying, I need a Cameron. I thought it was like a term from Jim Collins. I thought it was like a BHAG or a flywheel or a hedgehog concept. I, I'm like, you know, I think it's me, but I don't know why are they saying that? What they recognized was that Brian and I had this amazing relationship of having built the business and they wanted someone like me to help them. I would have been a horrible COO for almost all of those companies in the room. I'd probably be a horrible COO for your business. And we're gonna talk about those fits and how to actually know what you're looking for. I've played the second in command role three different times. Another business that I helped scale that is now global, it's the largest collision repair chain in the world. Has anyone heard of Gerber Auto Collision? It's about $2 billion in system-wide revenue. I was a co-founder in the franchising group for Boyd Auto Body and Gerber Auto Collision. That was prior to God Junk. And then also College Pro Painters. Has anyone heard of College Pro Painters? Or Serta Pro Painters, who I saw this morning. That was the sister company that we started. I opened the West Coast of the US for them. And then I was this, the president of a private currency company, similar to what Bitcoin is doing, but we built and sold the company for 60 million 23 years ago. So I had built three companies prior to even getting involved with 1-800-GOT-JUNK, and we're talk about how that worked. As um, they mentioned, I've written the book, The Second in Command. That's my sixth book. I started an organization seven years ago called the COO Alliance, which is like the collective genius, but it's only for the second in command. You're not allowed to go. You can send your COO. We hold two events in person a year. One's held at MIT's Endicott House, where the Entrepreneurial Master's Program runs events. We hold one of our events there every year. I host the Second in Command podcast, and we've had 350 COOs on our podcast. We get 100,000 listeners every month. And then I was written up in the actual magazine, the print edition of Fortune magazine about the rise of the COO group and talking about why we needed to have mastermind communities for COOs. So it just gives you a bit of credibility as to why I'm on this stage talking about this concept is I know the concept. And I know over the last couple of days, you've had some speakers touch on different areas of COOs. Some of that is my work that they're talking about, or some of that is work that I'll reference that they were talking about. Some of it, there's going to be a little bit of overlap, but you're going to hear it from a different perspective. You know, when we were kids, when we were like 16 years old, we all thought our parents were idiots, right? Like your mom was a bitch, right? My dad was an asshole. But then we, we you know, I meet your, your mom and dad. I think your mom was pretty cool. And you would have thought my dad was kind of cool. You're going to learn from Uncle Cameron more than you probably heard from some of your peers. So hopefully this, these lessons will kind of sink in a little further. I visualize the CEO, COO as a yin and yang, a real strong partnership more than any other relationship inside of the business, more than the CEO and CFO, more than the CEO and your chief technology officer, more than your head of operations, more than your head of real estate, whatever it is, it's kind of like the husband and wife in a traditional marriage are more important than all the aunts and uncles and friends around the family. A couple of our CEO Alliance members have described their second in command as the leash to the dragon. The COO is the leash to the entrepreneurial dragon or the brakes to the entrepreneurial gas. But they say it with a kind of respect and understanding that we're not really slowing you down. We're saving you from yourself, right? We're allowing you enough rope to still be CEO, but we're controlling some of the problems to help build your company for you towards your goals. The CEO and COO are very different. Almost like the, the relationship book, men are from Mars, women are from, from Venus. It's kind of like CEOs are from Mars, COOs are from Venus. We need to learn to understand each other and work together. Harvard wrote an article around 15 years ago called The Misunderstood Role of the COO, and they identified seven distinct types of chief operating officers. So we're going to talk a little bit about those so that you get an understanding as to why different COOs are different and why some of you in this room will have a different COO from others in the room and, and why that is different and, and why to understand that's different because you'll make huge mistakes just saying, oh, I'll, I'll hire Bob because he was a CFO for another Collective Genius Network member. That is a disaster waiting to happen right away. It's no different than if I was single saying, oh, you've been married before? You could be my wife then. Like, if you've been a wife, you could be my wife. What is that about, right? We make those same mistakes in business, so you need to understand some of the idiosyncrasies. 
So these seven distinct types of COOs have very different personality profiles and they come into the business for very, very different reasons. The first is the executor. This is the person that comes in to get done. It's often because the entrepreneur either has way too much on their plate or the entrepreneur is way too unorganized with the whole ADD squirrel and they see a million different opportunities, but they can't really focus on one. So you need someone to help you to get the stuff done. Another one is the change agent. This is typically somebody who comes into an organization to help, I hate the term, pivot, take you in a slightly different direction. Maybe it was during COVID when all of a sudden all the short-term rentals just kind of went away and we had to figure something else out. Or maybe when interest rates doubled and we had to figure something else out. Or maybe you're deciding to get out of one aspect of your business and get into a different aspect and you need to change all the employees in a different direction. That change agent can be a powerful second in command. You may have the mentor style. That was actually one of the core roles that I played with Brian at 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Remember when I walked in, I was employee number 14. They had six vice presidents, six people in the call center, and Brian. Five of the vice presidents didn't even have anybody reporting to them. They were just junior people with big titles. I had come into the business and I'd already built three companies. I'd already built $200 million companies. I'd already built two franchise companies. So I was coming in to tell Brian what to do. There was absolutely no delegation of stuff from Brian to me. In literally the first day, I gave him a hit list of everything we had to get done over the next two years. And then we started to execute on the plan. And I was basically just kind of like, you do IT and finance, I got this. That's when the mentor role comes into play is when you actually know how to build the business or you know how to scale that part of the industry. The other one is the other half, right? That was another key role that I played for Brian where he and I would even do speaking events together on the same stage. We'd literally be on stage at the same time we used to have a hand signal if one of us had to go to the bathroom because we'd do three-hour events, we'd go like this, which means I got to pee. And like we'd leave the stage, the other guy would just kind of ad lib for 15 minutes or five minutes and we'd come back on. But the other half was a big part where we were interchangeable. We would do interviews with the media. We'd do speaking events at the same time. We would both host or run board meetings. We'd run, like, we really could almost do each other's role other than maybe the, the pure unique ability areas that we would obsess about. Then you have the partner. That's often when you're starting a business or starting a new business area and you or maybe you do an acquisition or tuck under and you have that person as your partner and they might have a, a substantial equity position or a minority equity position in the company. And now you're playing a couple of roles. Like when I was the COO for Boyd Auto Body, which became Gerber Auto Collision, I was a partner in the company. I had an equity position in the company, but I really was the second in command to Terry Smith and then to Brock Bulbuck, our CFO. Those were the three partners in the organization. It's a very different role because you see it you see the business from a different lens and you're making decisions from a different perspective. And then you also have to have meetings where you're running the business as CEO, COO, and then you have to have other meeting rhythms in place where you're coming at the business as partners. And then you got the heir apparent. This is the person inside of your company who everybody knows is taking over the business. Maybe it's a, a daughter or a son in a family business, or maybe it's that key employee that you know you're going to be passing the business over to at some point. Can you imagine being Charles? And having to wait your entire life for your mom to die just so you can take over the company? Like, you're kind of hoping she lives, but you kind of want a shot. Like, that's all I thought about for years. I was always the second in command. I'm like, does he want his mom to die so he can be king? Or does he just want her to live for a while? So I don't know. It's weird. And then, and then you've got the MVP. The MVP is this person inside of your company who, God forbid, they ever quit. You know that you need them inside of your organization to help you scale. And if you don't give them that second in command role to handcuff them to the company, they're going to go, they're going to leave. Somebody else is going to poach them. And by the way, if you don't have your key people handcuffed to your company, guys like me come and poach them. And I do it for fun. You have to have your A players handcuffed to your company for at least five years. And it's not always equity. By the way, this is a quick ADD moment for you by Cameron Harrell. I'm going to talk a little bit about handcuffing. It's not part of the normal talk. But let's say that this table were my A players out of the whole room. This was my God forbid they ever quit. Well, not you, but this group. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Good, good. So these guys were my, my A players, right? For some, they want equity. For some, they want phantom stock. For some, they want profit sharing. For some, they want more visibility with the board, visibility with the CEO. They want to do their executive MBA while they're still here. They want more free time. They want more responsibility. They want you to spin off a division and let them run it. They want uh, more flexibility and more free time. See what they mean? There's different things that are important to different people. At 1-800-GOT-JUNK, when I was the second in command, I didn't really care about profit sharing or phantom stock in the company because my equity was coming off of the fact that everyone knew that I built the business. 
In fact, if you read Brian's first book, Willing to Fail, I'm mentioned throughout that book, like every 10 pages, my name, my name, my name, my, to the point that it got embarrassing. When I was first reading, I was like, I hope he talks about me. And then like page four, it's like, okay, stop. And then none of the other members of the leadership team for the first five years were mentioned once in the book, even though they were critical at building the business. But I knew that my equity was going to be off of me building the company and everyone knowing that. And there were other people that all they wanted was equity or all they wanted was stock options or all they wanted was profit sharing. I got the same amount of money out of the business as any of them did, but he handcuffed me by knowing what mattered to me. The cost of the wrong person is 15 times their annual salary. So if you're paying somebody $200,000 a year and they're the wrong one, it's really costing you $3 million a year to have them because of the opportunity cost, because of the problems and the mistakes that they cause, because of the negativity in the business, because of all the time that you have to spend with that wrong person when you could be spending the time with the right people. Like again, if these were my A players, the whole like super high results, super high core value, like God forbid they ever quit, but I was spending my time with Fred because he was struggling all the time. Imagine what could have happened if I just spent my time with this team. I could probably get rid of 30% of my employees if I worked with my A players. That was what we did really well at College Pro Painters was we gave our grain to our best horses. A players were racehorses, B players were workhorses, and we sent the C players to the glue factory. Um, but what you've got to identify here is if you have doubt, you have no doubt. If you know you've got the person in the wrong seat, you've got to get them out of the company, even if they're your second in command. So why do we hire a second in command? Why do we even call it a second in command? I'm going to get into that in a couple of minutes too, because it could be a COO, it could be a president, it could be a GM, it could be a production manager, operations manager. We're going to talk about titles in a second. But we hire a second in command to either free up time, to leverage our unique ability so we can work on those few areas that fuel us that we're really, really good at to maybe divide and conquer so we can get more done and so that we can scale faster. But at the end of the day, we only start our company for one of three reasons. We start a business to give us time so that we can do what we want, when we want, wherever we want, to give us money, right? So you can buy what you want, fly private, do whatever, have the fancy places, or to put a kind of stake in the ground or a flag in the ground, that feeling of accomplishment to say that we did it. Some of us struggle with the school system still and we need that feeling of accomplishment and praise. So we do the business to finally feel good about it because everyone else told us for 18 years in school that we were stupid or average. Well, once you get your business up and going, you've accomplished it. And at some point you got enough cash coming in. So the cash number doesn't matter as much. Often the second in command is to give you the better life. It's to free you up so you can do the stuff that you should be doing and want to be doing. And if, if you're the kind of person that says, well, business is my hobby, I got news for you. None of your friends like your hobby. You don't want to hear your friend talk about being a lawyer or talk about being a dentist or talk about being a doctor or so talk about selling insurance or talk about their real estate stuff. Like at some point, what we do to make money is boring and we need to reconnect with ourselves, our hobbies, our bucket list, the that matters in life so that we actually have a richer life. And then yes, pour everything you got into your business when you're doing your business, but you really do have to reconnect with all the other stuff that matters. If you don't have an executive assistant, you are one. If, if you reported to me, so the guy here, what do you earn on average in a year? About a million bucks. So you're earning about $500 an hour. So if I was your, because $500 an hour times 40 hours a week times 50 weeks a year is about a million dollars. So if I was on your board and I knew that I was paying you $500 an hour and you were doing $20 an hour tasks, $25 an hour tasks, I would fire you as CEO or COO. For real. I'd be like, what the f are you doing mismanaging our money? Or what are you doing mismanaging your money? Right? Why are you paying yourself $500 an hour to do something that's 25 bucks an hour? So my executive assistant, Meredith, has been with me for eight years. She'll earn about $110,000, $120,000 this year. She gets five weeks paid vacation. I got her an assistant last year to offload a bunch of her work. We now have an EA in the Philippines that Meredith offloads work to. For $1,800 a month, I have a full-time person based in the Philippines who speaks amazing English, who does a lot of the minimum wage work. I don't even know what that, what, what is that? Like nine bucks an hour or something? Like nine bucks an hour, right? It's super, it's high. Yeah, but like I, I'm going to pay her a little bit more because I want to handcuff her too. Like I want somebody in the Philippines, like even, I don't want her to leave, but you're right. But if you're, if you're someone making 150,000 a year or 350,000 a year or whatever, think about what your effective hourly rate is and then get an executive assistant to actually help you leverage that. So your EA can be your first second in command, right? Your EA can actually get stuff off your plate before you hire a COO. A lot of people say, oh, I need a second in command. I'll go pay somebody $250,000 a year. You could have an EA doing work for you for 20 grand a year or 50 grand a year or 80 grand a year. 
and save yourself one or two years of needing a true COO. The first thing to understand when you're looking to hire a second command is your activity inventory. It's all the stuff that you work on on a day-to-day -day basis. I learned this concept from Dan Sullivan who runs Strategic Coach. The basic idea is pretend, so pretend someone follows you around with a video camera and they capture everything you do day-to-day -day during the month. Reply to emails, open emails, book flights, set up calls, coach people, do speaking events, whatever, all these activities. You might end up with 80 different things on your list. So what I use is a spreadsheet. I open up a spreadsheet and in column A, I have this ongoing list of stuff that I do. In column B, I categorize all of the stuff in one of four ways. Either I for incompetent, meaning I suck at it. C for competent, meaning I'm okay at it. E for excellent, meaning I'm really, really good at it, but I don't love doing it. And U for unique ability, meaning I'm really, really good at it and I love doing it. Then in column C, I put an hourly rate down. If I was gonna pay someone to do that task all day, every day, all year, what would the hourly rate be for that task, right? What's the hourly rate for doing laundry? What's the hourly rate for cutting grass? What's the hourly rate for cleaning toilets? What's the hourly rate for cooking food? What's the hourly rate for driving a car to the airport? What's the hourly rate for doing a speaking event? What's the hourly rate for coaching, for opening emails, for like all the stuff. Then your job is to get all the stuff off your plate that you're incompetent or competent at or get all the stuff off your plate that is below your effective hourly rate. A really good friend of mine, uh, Dan Martell, recently wrote a book called Buy Back Your Time. He talks about taking your effective hourly rate and dividing it by four, and at least getting stuff off your plate that divided by four. So if you're $500 an hour to earn a million dollars a year, take 500 divided by four, it's 125 bucks an hour. I should at least get everything off your plate that's under 125 bucks an hour. But I even err in the favor of, of higher than that, right? Whatever your effective hourly rate is, my effective hourly rate for speaking is not my normal $40,000. My normal fee for speaking is 40,000 plus business class travel. People are like, oh, you get paid 40 grand for a 90 minute talk. That's not real because I actually have to like go to the airport, get on a plane, fly to the event, sit in a hotel room, come in in the morning, do a sound check, do my talk, sit and have lunch, go back to the, like, my effective hourly rates get split over time. My real speaking fee is $10,000 for a 60 minute keynote over Zoom. That was way more profitable talking to a group this morning over Zoom for 10 grand than flying from Vancouver to talk to you. So I have to think of my effective hourly rate in an offset, but I really do. Like I make decisions based on the hourly rate offset of what my time is actually worth. And I'll say no to some money in favor of other things, or I'll say no of some money in favor of having a life, right? At some point, I'd rather delegate stuff so that I can have time with my spouse, have time with my kids, have time with myself, have time with my hobbies versus chasing the rabbit constantly and working on minimum wage work that somehow gives me the dopamine rush. So the, if the activity inventory helps you decide who you can hire and how you can offload stuff to them, and that might be part of that second in command. And then you're gonna think about the title you're gonna give the person to be your second in command. Over the last 25 years, we've had massive title inflation in corporate America. So you think about back in the 90s, if anybody's old enough to remember the 90s, in the 90s, to have a COO title or a chief marketing officer title or a chief financial officer title or a chief technology officer, you had to be a major player in a major company. When I started at 1-800-GOT-JUNK for the first two years, I was the vice president of operations. Then I got the COO title for the last four years. But when I was COO there, my, my comp was 306000 That was 17 years ago. It, the compensation is one thing that you decide. What, what are you paying someone? Their title should match that. What are their roles and responsibilities? Their title should match that. What level of strategic insight can they bring into the company? Like, can they come in and show you what to do? Can they come in and tell you what needs to be done versus you delegating? That determines their title. What level of autonomy can they have in their day-to-day -day role? Like, do you need to manage them or they, can they self-manage everything? What level of P&L responsibility can they have? Can they manage the cash flow and budgets and make decisions around, around the financial side of the business for you? Can they bring in a level of financial acumen into the business that maybe you don't have? Based on those things is how you're going to decide the title. Your head of marketing could be a director of marketing or a vice president of marketing or a marketing manager or a chief marketing officer. Your CFO could be a controller or director of finance. Don't give out titles that are too big. And I've had people say, oh, it doesn't really matter what the title is. Really? Guess what that chief marketing officer is doing on weekends? They're on Google and they're on Indeed trying to figure out what chief marketing officers get paid. And all the chief marketing officers get paid between 400 and a million four. And they're coming into you asking for more money and they're not explaining their 
mindset because they're not looking at their roles and responsibilities, which is actually a director of marketing or a director of operations. So they think that they're a COO and really they're a general manager or they're a VP of operations. You don't think titles matter? Titles are one of the biggest negative impacts on your bottom line as a company. And if you give out a title too quickly to people, then they don't have anything to chase, right? If they start as the COO, what are you gonna give them next? But if you can start them as a VP operations, they can chase down that COO title and you give them that based on increased roles and responsibility, based on the metrics that they're hitting, based on the certifications and leadership development that they're getting and how they're growing as a leader, then you can give them more. When you have a true second in command in your company, there has to be such an implicit amount of trust between you and them. Brian and I had an unfair advantage. When I joined Brian as his COO, he was my best man at my wedding three months before I started to work for him. We'd already cried together. I already knew all of his He already knew all of my On day one, I had access to his bank account and passwords and everything. I had a CEO one time say, well, it'll take me about 90 days to know if I hired the right person. I said, that's because you suck at interviewing. If you have a proper interview system in place, use the proper thread of reference checks. If you've trained anybody in your company who manages people on how to do proper job interviews, then you'll have a lot more prediction on how to actually hire the right people. People are like, oh, well, college pro painters, that was just a bunch of students painting houses. How many students in my last year at College Pro, how many students do you think College Pro painters had painting houses in the summer? Take a wild guess. We had 8,800 people painting houses every summer. So I'll give you a scope to understand this. I was in the top 30 people in the company. There were 60 people at the head office. I was in the top 30 because the rest was back office. The top 30 were on operations team. We would, in four months, we would go out and recruit, interview, hire, and train 800 university students to be franchisees. So that was where I hired Kimball Musk and Peter Reeve and people, others that you actually even know the names of that went on to run very successful companies a year later. So we hired those people to be franchisees. And then in one month, we trained those 800 people how to recruit, interview, hire, and train 8,000 students to paint houses. Between May 1st and August 31st, we painted $64 million in houses. August 31st, 800 and 8,800 kids quit and went back to school. September 1st, we all got rip-roaring drunk. And September 2nd, we woke up and started it again. Imagine running a company where you had to hire 8,800 people in four months and 30 of you had to make that happen. That is not a simple task. So we had really, really strong systems in place to know what we were looking for and how to put the proper interview systems in place. We trained. I've gone through at least 100 hours of role playing, of practicing, of people filming me doing interviews, of people screening my interviews and giving me feedback on them on practicing in groups, like so much training around actually understanding how to do proper job interviews, but that's where I have predictability on my success. Business isn't hard. You make it very hard for yourselves when you focus on real estate. Real estate isn't what you do. Running a business is what you do. Or if you run a marketing company, everybody's training their people on digital marketing and buying Facebook ads and buying, that's not what you do. Leading people is what you do. Hiring people is what you do. Onboarding people is what you do. It's no wonder that every lawyer and every dentist and every doctor struggles with running a business. If you ever talk to a lawyer, dentist, and doctor, ask them, when you were in school, your seven or 10 years of ridiculous education you had to do, how much training did they give you to run a company? You know what they'll say? Between one to five hours in the whole seven years on running a company, and yet they all leave, I'll open up my dental practice. Well, you're f When you're bringing people into a second-in-command role, you have to hire people that have done it before. If you hire someone because they know how to do it, there's lots of people out there that have read books. You need to hire people that have done it before. If you want to have somebody who has, like, would you ever hire someone to build a house for you because they know how to do one? Or would you hire someone who's done it before? You probably want the one who's done it before, right? It's the same with somebody who's led teams or built project teams or run marketing. You need to build that into your system and know how to find the people that have done it before know where to find the people that have done it before. And you actually need to craft job postings and job descriptions and have copywriters polish them so they pop off the page so that then you can actually go out and poach people and bring them into your company. Your best players, your best C-level players, your best executive team players are not on Indeed and Craigslist looking for a job. They have a job. Your job is to entice them and poach them and pull them away. And you need to think about what are the things that you're doing to recruit them and to bring them into your business so that you can actually poach them and bring them away. And it's not always gonna be compensation. When I left 1-800-GOT-JUNK, 12 months later, Brian finally brought my replacement in. She was the former president of Starbucks USA. 
She'd run all of operations for Starbucks North America or USA before she came in to, to be the CEO at 1-800-GOT-JUNK. She came in for less pay than she was making at Starbucks, no equity, but she came in as a, because the job posting and the job description was such a huge opportunity for her to build a name around something else versus a business that had already been built. Unfortunately, she was the wrong hire. She was fired a year later because she was too corporate and she didn't work out very well. So how do you leverage one? How do you bring a second in command or a senior person into your company and leverage that? I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. It starts in the first 90 days. The first 90 days that you bring a senior person into your organization, most of us mess this up. Most of us are so relieved and so glad that we have this person finally, or we're so tired from the recruiting and interviewing process that we just want them to start. It's like, hey, here's the team you're working with. I'm so glad you're here. I'll see you on Monday at our team meeting. Or maybe you do like an hour over coffee and you talk about the history of the company. In the first 30 days, the senior person you're bringing in, their job is to do nothing. They're not allowed to make a decision. Their job is to sit in on every business area's meetings as often as they can. Sit in on finance meetings, sit in on marketing meetings, sit in on production meetings, go ride shotgun in the field, sit in on sales calls, go talk to customers, listen in on customer service calls. Their job is to get blind CC'd on communication from all the executive team for an entire 30 days so they can read what's happening and get a lay of the land. Their job is to go for virtual or in-person lunches and dinners with everyone who manages people in the company for 30 days until they understand the business and the idiosyncrasies and the relationships of people. Their job is to read any of the manuals that exist, to sit in on training sessions for any business areas that exist. Their job is for you to brief them, ideally over video, because you don't. if you do this once properly, you can then have everybody watch the video, brief them on your company core values and your core purpose and your BHAG and your vivid vision and the history of how you got to where you are so they understand the kind of the why. We're going to talk about a little later, Simon Sinek's kind of why, how, what, golden circle model. Has anybody heard of Simon Sinek? Simon was on our board of advisors five years before he did that TEDx talk in Seattle. Five years before he wrote the book, Start With Why, he was on our board when he was managing a six-person company in New York. He flew out to Vancouver to meet Brian and I after reading about us in Fortune magazine, and he wanted to find out if our company was real. So I knew Simon way before anybody on the planet knew Simon. His is so dialed in around understanding the why my work is around the how, and most companies only focus on what. We train people on what we do. I obsess around the, the how we do it. And then Simon's idea around the why is critical to indoctrinate anybody coming into your company. And actually, in the rest of the time in month one, they walk around with a notebook. And I'm talking a physical notebook with a pen and paper. And their job is to write down. And the reason I want pen and paper versus anything digital is I don't want any temptation to take their idea and to do anything with their idea. I want to fire Bob, but great, write it down. I want to hire, move Kelly into a different role. Cool, write it down. I want to put a CRM in place. Awesome, write it down. I want to start this. Great, write it down. I want to stop that. Good, write it down. I want you at the end of 30 days to have 50 different ideas on what you think we should do with the company. And in the first 30 days, I don't want you to have started or tried or talked to anybody about any of those things. In month two, your job is to go back and test the hypotheses of all of those 50 things. Go talk to a few people about Bob and you realize, no, we don't have to fire Bob. We got to fire Kelly. We need to promote Bob. Or we don't need a CRM, we actually need something else. And your job as that second command is to go back and test your hypotheses and come up with which of these projects are the core projects that we should do now. And then almost like building a home where every entrepreneur wants to put in the wolf stove and the cool cabinets, but we got to pour the foundation. And like that sits for like a month. It's so horrible when you're building a home and a homeowner because it feels like nothing's happening for a month. And then you're putting up the framing and that's like four f***ing months and nothing's like, you just want to see the wolf stove, but I want to see the cabinets that comes like a year later. Well, some of the projects that they're thinking of doing in that second month are the foundational projects. It's the electrical and the plumbing and the stuff that's not sexy, but needs to be done. You need them in their second month to know which projects to do when, and in month three to start putting in place the projects that are the easy wins. I call them the low PETA factor, the low pain in the factor. They don't require a lot of people, time or money to make that project happen. And then that project's kind of like launching a satellite. That once you put a bunch of that effort in, that satellite's now orbiting the earth forever for free. That's a good project to have worked on because your employees will feel good about the result and they see that result paying off forever, which gives them trust in you and all the other bigger hairy projects you wanna do later. And by the end of the third month where you're now putting some of these easy win projects in place, then you've earned the trust and you understand the business well enough to start making decisions around people like firing people, recruiting people, changing things, integrating bigger project decisions. That's the onboarding just in the first 90 days. Our job as the CEO or the entrepreneur is to look for the ripple effects. Any senior person you bring into your company is like a big boulder 
that you're going to drop into the pond. It's like, I hired a big boulder. I want to drop them into the pond. They'll sink to the bottom just perfectly, right? They're going to accomplish their job. A boulder into a pond is going to get to the bottom just perfectly. But if you don't look at all the ripples on the pond, you miss all that stuff, right? Well, when you bring that COO or that VP operations into your company, they're going to bring in a lot of things that are going to cause ripples. There are going to be good things that happen. There's going to be bad things that happen. There's going to be people that are pissed off. There's going to be people that feel like they should have had the job. There's going to be people that are excited. There's going to be people that are disappointed. They don't get to walk to talk to you anymore. There's going to be customers that see the business is operating or changing in a different way. Your job is to look for the good and bad unintended consequences and ripple effects and actually be there to talk to the person and talk to the team about those things. In the first month that Brian and I started working together, we brought in a relationship coach to work with us because I was causing problems and we didn't even see them happening. Not necessarily negative problems, but my style was so different because I'd built companies before and I was the outsider coming into this team that were really already highly gelled. So you have to look for those opportunities. You and the COO need time to get away from the rest of the kids. You need time and a space to actually work on the business together. Brian and I had a space at our, our main office that no one even knew existed for the first two years we were in this facility. This small little meeting room over by the freight elevators, it was, it was like a storage room that we converted into a meeting room with beanbag chairs and whiteboards, and no one knew about it for two years except he and I. It was just a place that we could go and lock ourselves in and go, holy f how are we gonna do this? What are we gonna do? Or just brainstorm. Or we'd get out of the office and work from his tennis club or my golf club, or we'd get away from the office and go for lunches and dinners and just time to get away from the, to, to work together and stay in sync. We also had what we called date night. We had time away from the kids, time away from the rest of the team to re-sync as friends and to hang out and do fun stuff together. You're not necessarily gonna be best friends with your COO, but you definitely have to have a great relationship with your COO and a great level of trust. That means spending time together and being intentional. My job as COO was to shine a spotlight on Brian to make him look good, to make him kind of the icon of the organization. And his job internally was to make sure that I look good because I was roll always rolling out the tough decisions I was always bad cop to his good cop or the leash to his dragon. He had to internally make me look good as I was externally making and internally making him look good. And then the party's over, right? At some point, your company may outgrow the people that you're hiring. There's um, some data points that a senior person can only stay in their role for when the company has gone through two doubles in revenue. By the time you try to do the third double, it's too hard for them to stay in that role. So if you're, you're a $5 million company and you've got a head of operations, they can be head of operations at 10 million. They can probably be head of operations at 20 million, but it's going to be tough for them to stay head of operations at 40 million. Ben Horowitz, who wrote The Hard Thing About Hard Things, said the senior executive can only go through one triple. It's too hard to go to the next triple. So if you're 5 million, you can get it to 45, but it's too hard to go from 45 to triple that. So we're at the same rough data points. I took the company from 2 million to 106 million. That was brutally hard. Partially, it was easy in the first couple of years because I, I was kind of way, way below my pay grade doing the work I was doing. So it didn't even get tough for me until we got to about 30 million. And then after a couple doubles, it started to get big. When we got to the 100 million mark, the head of the call center had been replaced. The head of finance had been replaced. The head of IT had been replaced. The head of franchise sales had been replaced. And then Tuesday or Thursday morning, Brian and I were having our uh, leadership team meeting. We usually have a leadership team meeting every Thursday at 8 a.m., and Brian and I would often meet for breakfast before that just to get in sync and discuss what we were going to do going into the meeting. And I ordered my traditional Eggs Benedict. I used to weigh 40 pounds heavier than I do today. Ordered my Eggs Benny and Brian ordered a grapefruit. I'm like, grapefruit? You never f***ing order grapefruit. You always have Eggs Benny too. Like extra sauce half the time or like chorizo on the side. What's with the grapefruit? And he teared up and he said, I think it's over. And I started to cry and I said, I told your assistant you were firing me last night. And his comment to me was, you were the right guy to get us from 2 million to 100 million, but you're the wrong guy to take us from 100 million to the billion. And I knew that as well. I'd known for a year. From about 50 million to 100 million, it had gotten big. I was pulling my hair out trying to figure this thing out, but it had just gotten, we had 13 operating P&Ls operating in four countries, 330 people at the head office, 3,000 people system-wide. It was just f***ing big. When Lonnie came in as a former president of Starbucks USA, she's like, what a cute little company. Very different perspective on the same thing. So at some point, the party will be over. The key is to make that transition and to do it in the right way and not feel bad about it. But there's only really one way you can get around that transition. There's only one way you can get someone like me to be there for the six-year period. One is or two. One is to hire the person that has done it before, so you have so much predictability that it buys them the first few years. And then the last part is to work really heavily on the skill development of the people 
Because if you grow their skills, they can probably get at least another year or two out of that. As CEOs, we're often luckier because we can keep delegating more and more, but it's hard for that senior team. So at some point, the party is over.